And what I'm going to be talking about is, in a way, picking up on some of the themes that Ram was talking about in terms of human aspects of security, talking about some of what we could consider to be practical barriers to actually achieving security properly uh, across an organization because of some of the issues that the people that we're expecting to uphold the protection, to play their part in it, often aren't particularly well equipped to do so. So in terms of the content, I'll give a brief introduction to the theme and then look at some of these barriers to good practice. Now, I'm not claiming that this is an absolutely exhaustive set, but there are at least some options here that I'm, Im I'm going to imagine you're going to recognise some of the issues. And then towards the, the latter half of it, think about what we might be able to do to improve the situation. So how can we help people to overcome at least some of these in practice? And then some conclusions. So, well, I don't know to what extent you will uh, sort of subscribe to this view, but very often I think when we're trying to pitch the security message to people within an organisation, it's not necessarily the most willing, enthusiastic, accepting audience of the message that we're trying to sell to them. Because very often what we're asking them to do is something over and above what they might naturally do for themselves. And so you're asking to, them to do additional things, you're placing an additional workload and mental burden on them through the different activities, through the different technologies that uh, they will have to then utilise to help you out here. So it's behaviours that might not come naturally to these individuals. So maybe even something they actively dislike doing, and so if there's an opportunity to get around it, then that might be the, the route that they will choose to go. And at the very least, sometimes, security is perceived to be an obstacle in the way of getting, basically in your way, in terms of getting on with the job of work that you're trying to do, rather than something that's actually there as an enabler to the overall context of the workplace and the organisation actually functioning properly. Okay, so we can face challenges at several levels. Now that can be the technology that we're requiring people to get on with, or indeed the, the messaging and the behaviour that people will naturally have and that we might want to try and influence through some of our awareness raising and training initiatives. So, so broadly categorising them, some of the barriers that we might encounter is, well, the question that they might pose is, why do I need to do it? Um, and it might be, why do I need to do it? Why is it not somebody else's issue to deal with? Why is it something that has to bother me rather than be managed for me? If they accept that message, well, what do I need to do? It's, okay, there is something required of me. Is it just this one thing? Are there several things? How often do I have to do it, etc.? Then they need to know how to do it. Is it straightforward? Is it easily achievable? And then they don't understand it, and then perhaps it takes too long. So maybe they've accepted all of the other things, but then at the end of the day, this is a bit of a pain, and so it would be much nicer if I could just forget about it and get on with what I wanted to do. So thinking about it in a slightly different way, I, I've turned it on this slide, the security hurdles, in the sense that what we actually need people to do is to be able to get over each of these and get to a position where they're able to play their part effectively. So if I, I run through this quickly, we've got the hurdle of perception, which is actually recognising that there are threats or particular threats that they need to be aware of that actually apply to them. Then there's the hurdle of prioritising it appropriately. So, okay, they might recognise a, th a threat exists and that perhaps somebody ought to be doing something about it, but perhaps they don't think it's that important compared to X, Y and Z other things that they could be getting on with. Then it's a hurdle of responsibility in terms of realising actually that's something for them to be dealing with rather than just thinking it's somebody else's problem. And if you can overcome those three hurdles, then you've oriented somebody at least to realising that there's something important that they should be doing in order to support security. Potentially, though, that's not the end of the problem, so I've got some dotted lines to indicate other potential hurdles that they might need to cross in terms of having the confidence to be able to do something, so believing that they're in a position to do it, perhaps even having the, the actual technical capability and skill to do what's required of them, and perhaps the ultimate hurdle, the usability of the technologies, tools, techniques that we're actually requiring somebody to go through in order to basically fulfil the overall responsibility we expect of them. So, in actual fact, when you think about all the different elements of security, this could be quite a tall order in order to get people to buy into this and to retain, if you like, the enthusiasm to actually do it. So, of course, we know in terms of... Uh, 
observing other people. Of course, it doesn't apply to us because we're all naturally secure and we do everything that's required of us. But other people, we can see that it's not just a case that that person is secure, that person is insecure or unsecure in terms of their behaviour. Um, there's often a, a spectrum of behaviour, of attitude that you can notice. So it might relate to their acceptance of the issue in the first place, but certainly their consequent compliance that comes through in terms of how they behave in relation to the technologies, the controls expected of them. So what I've summarised here is a, a set of potential compliance categories or degrees of compliance and non-compliance. And I've represented it in this sort of shape to indicate that in an organisation without anything particular having been done to raise the security profile and messaging, perhaps what we might expect is the majority of people would be in this sort of zone, and I've got some definitions of them in a second, relatively few people at the very top and hopefully relatively few people at the very bottom. So just remember that sort of shape and the fact that those above the line are in green because they're good and those below the line are in red because they're varying degrees of bad. And I've got some description here. So think of what I've termed culture here. I'm saying this is the ideal state where their security behaviour is basically taking a security related aspect into everything that they're doing. So they have to perform a task, they think implicitly of the security implications or whether there might be security implications of doing this way or doing it that way. Next down the list is commitment, so maybe security is uh, not a natural part of their behaviour in the way that it would be for somebody with security culture, but if they're given guidance, if they're given leadership on the issue, then they will actually do the job that's expected of them in relation to the controls. Then, next level down is obedience. Perhaps they don't fully understand, perhaps they don't fully believe in what they're being asked to do, but nonetheless, because they're being told to do it, and because it's a directive from authority within the organisation, for example, you've still got them actually buying into it, ultimately through their actions and going on with it. Next level down, and we're still in the compliance categories here, is awareness. So now people are aware that they have a security role but they might not be fully complying with all the things that they're supposed to be doing because perhaps they're not as certain, perhaps they're not as familiar with all of the different aspects to it. Then you've got a bit of a sort of grey area here between ignorance and awareness. Here it's pe people still might be sort of sometimes complying, sometimes not, but now it's because they're not aware of some of the security issues. It's not that they're actively being disobedient, they're actively trying to break the rules, but because they've not had sufficient awareness raising, there are things that they will be doing that are actually not within the bounds of the policy you're trying to enforce. Next level down I've termed apathy, so now users are aware, you've done the awareness raising bit, but they're not motivated to actually care about it. So they've had the training, if you like, they've had the, the messaging, but Whatever you've done, there isn't that incentivization to get them on board properly. Then there's resistance. So users are actively now working against security in some way, not trying to destroy it necessarily, but because they're perhaps lazy, because there are easy workarounds for doing things, they are not following the good practice because they have an option not to and um, because they don't really care too much about it. And then at the very bottom level, now we've got people actively working against the security. So this would en encompass our insider abusers, people intentionally breaking the rules, actively trying to circumvent controls. Okay, so, so not a necessarily completely scientific set of categorizations, but hopefully there's something here that you could recognize about varying levels of compliance amongst people that you've worked with, maybe in your organizations now. And what it does do is paints a picture that when we're trying to then target awareness raising, monitoring, etc., we're not just talking about one particular type of behavior. Okay, so let's think about some of the, the barriers that play a role within this. So, firstly, is around actually understanding the point of security, role within it, etc. So, in terms of your own staff, what security responsibilities do they actually have? What is expected of the average user, the average member of staff on a day-to-day -day basis? And do they actually know what these responsibilities are? How do they know? Has there been sufficient awareness raising within the environment? So, just as a show of hands to continue the interactivity of the afternoon, how many people think that they have staff who do know what their security responsibilities are? 
Okay, so the fair majority, so that's good. So have, have the responsibilities been promoted to them effectively? Is, it, is the fact that they know about them down to awareness raising that you've done, for example? Okay, so there's been active promotion. How many people think their staff would have naturally known about things without anything having to be done to support them? Okay, so we, we accept the fact that there needs to be some advocacy here. So, having said that, many organisations do seem to go as far as they've been able to tick a box to say they've got something that outlines what the security policy and procedures are and well from that perspective they, they've ticked the box in terms of if somebody doesn't comply with the rules they can have that person on the basis of non-compliance and just to illustrate that potentially um, taking some results from this year's information security breaches survey the one that PricewaterhouseCoopers have published the results of only 26% of organisations with a security policy, and from the survey respondents, about 95% of large organisations said they had a security policy. Only 26% of organisations that have a policy think their staff have a very good understanding of it. And actually 21%, so just over a fifth, believe that their staff's understanding of it is poor. And you've got to ask yourself, why is that then? So they've gone to the effort of producing a policy, but presumably there hasn't been the full extent of accompanying promotion and awareness raising of it. Again, that actually their understanding of the policy, according to the respondents, was clearly linked to what those respondents claim to have done in terms of security education. So, basically on this chart, what it's showing is whether they had a program of ongoing security education or whether it was something only done at the point of induction. And so the, the question was, how do respondents ensure that their staff are aware of security threats? So you've got the breakdown by the size of organisation for this year's survey and a comparison to the, the version two years ago. So you can see that you know, it's the majority of large organisations have ongoing education, small organisations are almost half of them. And then if we look at how they then reported the, the staff understanding of the policy, so those with a very good understanding, if they had ongoing security education, it was far more likely for them to have a, a very good understanding than if they had security education at induction only, or indeed much more likely than if they had no security awareness raising initiatives in place. Similarly, inverse for those with poor understanding, if they did nothing about security promotion, then perhaps unsurprisingly, they had a poor understanding. And those with ongoing security education pushing the message more regularly, relatively few then had a poor understanding. So there is that relationship, at least from what the survey respondents were saying, that shows that good practice actually works. Who'd have thought it? Okay. So I mentioned another potential barrier is actually dealing with the technology itself. So in terms of the usability issues that we might face, and again, you might recognize some of these from personal experience, we get the technology put in front of us, and I'm now talking about the, the things we use through tools, applications, features within applications and operating systems relating to security. Potentially a reliance upon technical terminology. Um, functionality that is actually unclear and confusing when it requires the user to do something about it, particularly when they need to make a security-related decision. So very often the, you know, the, the basic interface is all very nice and uh, you know, it looks fairly straightforward and simple, but then something happens. So say, for example, we're, we're dealing with a piece of uh, internet security or antivirus software, obviously not from Kaspersky or ESET, um, but other vendors' uh, products. If it then pops up a security alert and asks the user, what do you want to do? Do you want to quarantine? Do you want to delete? Do you want to, et cetera? How does the user make a decision? And very often, that's the point at which the very nice, colourful display and the dashboards and all of that ceases to be very helpful because they can't appreciate exactly what the risk is, what would be the implications of the different options they can select. Linked to that sometimes is a lack of visible or informative feedback, so knowing actually what is going on. And I say forcing uninformed decisions, which can link to several of those indeed. So let's have a look at an example, not from an internet security package specifically, but from Internet Explorer. It's a web browser, many people will use it. And if they were to, to go into the, the internet options and click on the security tab, you've got this 
I suppose, fairly straightforward looking interface which talks about setting the security level for different zones that you might be browsing. So the internet, your local internet, and then specifically for trusted or restricted sites. So for the internet zone then, this is for generally visiting websites on the internet, set the security level for the zone. And you've got this nice slider, you can move it up and down, works as a slider would be expected to do. And you've got the default setting here of medium high. And, uh, okay, I'll read through the description of it and see if it, it makes sense. So it says, appropriate for most websites. So that's fairly reassuring. Prompt before downloading potentially unsafe content. Sounds okay. Do we know what potentially unsafe content is? Is it... Is our understanding of what potentially unsafe content might encompass the same as actually what the program protects against? Maybe not. Unsigned ActiveX controls will not be downloaded. Okay. Now, I expect a reasonable response in this audience. How many people know what an unsigned ActiveX control is? Okay. So, about two -third, half to two-thirds. Now, in a normal audience of people, we can say, a lot less people tend to know what that is. So that's a bit of technical terminology that perhaps doesn't play well with the average Internet Explorer user. Okay, so whether an unsigned ActiveX control, I mean, many people don't know what an ActiveX control is, so the active component technology that can run within the browser, executable content, and for it to be unsigned means it's not got a digital signature so you can't verify the origin. Many people don't know what that means, so that's, okay, it's part of the description, everything else sounds okay, we'll accept that. Which is alright if you're going to stick with the defaults, but if you want to actually start making an informed decision about, is that slider in the correct position for you, or could you put it lower if you wanted, should you put it higher? then you start to need to understand what it's actually talking about. To go a level further, we could go into the custom settings. And now we get a more interesting, enriched set of options, so we can potentially allow scriptlets. Um, we can disable that, we can enable it, we can be prompted. Um, hands up for scriptlets, anybody who knows what they are? Okay. Um, automatic prompting for ActiveX controls, well we've established that one. Binary and script behaviours. Very descriptive, isn't it? They can be administrator approved, disabled, or enabled. Who'd like to choose an option? Um, display video anima and animation on a web page that does not use... Oh, well, we'd have to scroll across, but uh, probably we can understand video and animation. Um, download signed... Act and it goes on, and there's about 50-odd of these different options. Notably, you may have noticed already on the page, no help... You can't click on anything. Um, there used to be an older version of Internet Explorer, a context-sensitive help icon you could click there. And if you selected it, it told you that these were the customizable options, basically. And it defined what enable and disable meant, but it didn't describe what any of the actual options were. Um, and if you go into the help system in Internet Explorer, so if you were to quit this, do a search on the help system, it doesn't define it there either in many of the cases. Okay, so it's at that level it gets a lot more tricky for somebody to understand. Of course, you could argue you know, quite easily, okay, if it's a non-technical user, they shouldn't be in there anyway. But you know, a lot of you that were quite happy with the ActiveX, unsigned ActiveX concept, suddenly we're not sure now what these various options are. And to be honest, I wouldn't remember without going and searching either. Now, we've changed something in the custom, uh, custom options now, and we come out, and now we're told our security level is custom. What's wrong with that then? Um, well, one thing it doesn't tell you is, is that then custom lower than what the default was? Is it customised higher? One thing Internet Explorer does do now is if you set some of the settings to a, a setting that leaves you vulnerable, it does actually start saying you've got it um, set to a risky level. It has a, a warning uh, symbol over the, the Internet security zone. And then if you try and quit out, it continues to warn you that you've left a setting vulnerable. But if it's not an explicitly vulnerable setting, you've got no indication of whether you're now set at custom high, custom low, custom whatever. So that's just one example in an application that many people use of an encounter with security not being quite as straightforward as it first looked on the surface with that very nice functional up and down slider and the nice easy to understand medium, low and high type of terminology. Yeah. 
yeah, so that would be an option, certainly within an organization where it's appropriately managed. But remember, you know, for many, I'm talking in a lot of this around how the user has an attitude towards security in general. So these will be things they also encounter on their personal systems. In some organizations, it won't be set centrally. They will still have some option to change things. And that's just one instance of uh, an example where they could encounter security features within a general application. I and mean, obviously you wouldn't expect the average user to just have free reigns configuring your organizational firewall, etc. But uh, there are things where you want them to be able to make an informed decision. Now, another aspect is, okay, I mean, they don't actively go looking to change anything, but there will be many things on a day-to-day -day basis where they encounter security and it takes up some of their time. So things like entering passwords and pins. We, we encounter them all the time on our devices, on websites, etc. Checking through spam or junk mail just to check that nothing has been misclassified and you're not about to lose something that you should have seen. Doing system updates at a time taken to download and apply patches, um, AV signature updates, things of that nature. Performing the actual scans, performing backups. All of these things have a tendency to require some time and some attention from the users. Again, within an organization, certain aspects of this might be outside of their control and it's done for them without them having to make a decision. But but still, these things can have an impact in terms of what they see. Uh, now, I'm not going to explain exactly how I got to this. There's a, a, a podcast on our iTunes U collection, which actually gives you the numbers that sit behind this. But I calculated that for me, at least, based on the number of times I do certain things, this takes me about one waking day per annum just doing these sort of things. The, the few seconds here, the few minutes there, these things add up. And I seem to spend quite a bit of my life doing something about security. That's not counting actually talking about it in contexts like this. So that's just saying about the day-to-day -day things. That's not talking about other more specific activities that I might then do um, you know, on a, a less frequent basis. So there's going to be other things that happen more specifically, so in sort of new versions of complete software, etc. This is just the, the routine day-to-day -day stuff. So, Implication. Security already, already requires a lot of our time. Okay? So if we then think about the average user, if we're going to be introducing further aspects for them to consider, they're not going to be overly tolerant, perhaps, of things that are difficult to understand, seem to make their life complicated, take too much of their effort, or indeed slow their system down, which is another perception of certain types of security when you talk to the, the average user. So that needs to be recognized in terms of the way that we offer systems to people and indeed in the way that they're developed and designed in the first place. And you know, ultimately, if we as organizations deploying the technologies find that these considerations haven't been taken into account in the design and development, we need to try and compensate for that in terms of our awareness raising and promoting of the message. Okay, so we did a little survey of um, IT users, it's a bit of an ongoing survey actually, 90% of them claim to be using antivirus on their PC. Um, they had varying levels of knowledge about whether they were using it properly. But of those that didn't, and this was a significant bit, 55%, so it's not a huge sample, but half of those who said they didn't do it said it was because it would slow their system down. Now, we're talking very small numbers within this sample now, but the, the received wisdom for not doing it very often is because it will slow my system down. Okay, and that's, that is then leading a lot of people, ultimately, to be unprotected. Okay, so... People need to be aware of the problems. If they don't get past that first hurdle of perception, then lots of things that they ought to be considering are going to remain open for them. Okay, so there's ample examples of threats getting overlooked by people who ought to know better. And that's even in cases, as I say here, where the problem that we're dealing with is not exactly an unfamiliar one. So let's think about malware. Okay, we, we have representatives of internet security companies here. We know that malware is a significant threat. But mobile malware, malware on mobile devices, smartphones, particularly Android platform at the moment, it's seen a significant increase over the recent year or so. So some figures here from Kaspersky from earlier in the year, a 600% increase in mobile device malware in just eight months. Okay, compared to January 2011, when there were just 20 unique samples, now we're talking over 12,000. Okay, and that, these stats were from about uh, June of this year, so I'm sure it's increased considerably since then. So, mobile malware, potential problem is the point of this slide. 
Okay, mobile malware on Android devices is a particular problem, according to this slide, from the same time period. Okay, so not such a problem, for example, on an iPhone platform, as was mentioned earlier in the day. Unless it's a jailbroken iPhone device, it's not going to have such an easy route onto the platform. Whereas Android, it is quite straightforward. So, going back to that little survey we did earlier, 28 of our respondents... Again, not huge numbers, but 28 of them had Android phones. So it was a, almost a well, third or a quarter of the respondents. 86% said they were using some sort of authentication on their Android device. So they had some awareness of the sensitivity of the device, the need to protect it from that particular threat vector of um, unauthorized use. But only 19% had antivirus. Now, of those same respondents that didn't have it, or those same Android users, 82% of the Android users had antivirus on their PC, but they didn't have it on their mobile phone. Okay, so the basic thing is they're not recognising the existence of that particular threat in the different context, even though the evidence would suggest it's manifestly growing, okay? So there's an awareness raising issue there in terms of getting those people on board and understanding. Now another thing that we could suggest based on problems around usability, encounters with security is perhaps there's a concept of security fatigue. The point at which you feel, oh God, it's just taken so much, it's taken so much of my time, it hasn't worked, I haven't been protected after all, and maybe you know, all that good practice that I've been trying to follow is just not worth it, I'm going to stop. Okay, so potentially security fatigue. And I say it's already potentially lower on the to-do list than other things that you feel you must do. Um, so what we're talking about is a potential erosion of good practice and potentially goodwill towards using security, it's not that they just didn't care about it, it's just gradually got to them, maybe to the point where they actually stop entirely. Um, and they switch into this, this mode where they're not doing it. And then you're having to basically get security practice maintained through enforcement rather than just by the choice of the individual to comply because they recognise the good practice. So what we could think of here is factors around the effort that's involved for somebody to, to be security compliant, the difficulty in doing it. So the effort is how often, for example, do they have the security related encounters. The difficulty is on the basis of each encounter, um, how much effort do they need to put in. And then the importance aspect is, you know, is it important enough to warrant the effort and the difficulty that I'm encountering with it? So what we could then get is a measure of potential fatigue. So the effort and the difficulty divided by the importance, for example. So if security is difficult and they have to do it very often but don't regard it as important, then the potential for somebody to get fatigued by it and therefore the potential for them to stop wanting to comply is increased. Okay? Whereas if it's something that's fairly straightforward that they don't encounter very often, you're more likely to get them to go along with it. There would be an issue of cost if you're talking about the person who's making the deployment decision. I'm thinking about the, the individual from the perspective of do I try and use it or not. So if they're also the person who's buying the, the technology, that will feature as well. But even if it's something they bought for good reason, they still might decide that they're fatigued in terms of their use of it. Yeah, I mean, you see the guy tries to back on the security box onto the trolley. Yeah, so I think, I mean, that would relate more to the, the buying into the idea in the first place. So what I'm saying with security fatigue is these are people who'd got the message, they were doing the, using the technology, they were following good practice, and then it has ground them down to the point where they don't like it anymore. It's an interesting visible hurdle. Uh, yeah, so... As soon as you said it, that's immediately... So I think that one would relate to the very first hurdle, which is that perception thing. I think that in this context we're talking about people who they would got over that one but now they've had a setback basically. So p implications of that is if there are workarounds available, if there's a means of getting past the technology not using it then perhaps that's what people would do. And of course the bad experience could affect their future encounters. So they might decide that security then is something that they don't like. So then maybe if they're in PC world and they're being asked do they want to buy the, the new technology package with or without the internet security on it, they might say, well, I didn't like it before, I'm not going to have it again now. Um, so as they become more fatigued, perhaps the less security compliant they'll become as a result. So this you know, leaves us with a few.
tricky issues, all, the, all these barriers. So put some potential thoughts towards filling the gaps. And one thing that we, uh, we need to be concerned about is the investment in training. So we need to promote the message. We need to raise that message. And I so say the show of hands that went up earlier suggests that at least within the room, there are some good efforts going towards that. If we look at this particular survey, which is uh, CSI, Computer Security Institute in the US, um, still I think the most recent version of the survey, um, this is the investment that they make in terms of security training. What proportion of their security budget is allocated towards training? You see, just over a third there, less than 1% of their security budget goes in this direction. And uh, relatively few in an overall context, so relatively few are investing more than 10% there. Now you might say, okay, maybe that's considered sufficient in this context, maybe they need to be spending more in the other directions, which are around security services, security technology, etc. If we look at another result from the same survey, they were basically asked whether the investment in different aspects of security was adequate. And there were five areas overall, so end user security awareness training, regulatory compliance efforts, forensics, security technology, security services. These are the results for the adequacy of investment in training. And it's notable that training was the only one in which the majority view, just about, was that there was too little investment in that area. Okay? So in all, in all the other contexts, you know, there, were, there were more people saying perhaps too much, um, and fewer people certainly saying there was too little spent. But training, it was a recognised shortcoming amongst the respondents, who in many cases would have been the ones responsible for making those spending decisions. Now I throw this particular study in uh, simply because the co-author of the study is sat there holding up a thing that now tells me how long I've got before I run out of time. Uh, this was something that John and I did, it was John, part of John's master's project actually back in uh, 2003. And what we did here was we surveyed a number of organisations and asked them, uh, went in at two levels, the, the general staff and the IT security manager, let's say, and asked basically the IT security manager, did the organisation have a security policy? And if so, were staff required to sign to say they understood it um, and would abide by it? So, um, in 56% of cases, um, genuinely, these particular respondents, there was no security policy and they therefore hadn't been required to sign it. The interesting proportion... Um, was they said, um, no, they didn't have uh, a security policy in the organisation, when in actual fact they did, and they'd been asked to sign up to it at some point. So the fact was they simply weren't remembering the message. Okay, so the fact was the organisation was still able to tick the box that staff had signed up to say they would comply with it, so if they didn't, you know, they were banged to rights, but the staff didn't remember. Um, there was also an interesting 12% that had signed up when there was no policy for them to have signed up for. Um, they were, let's say they were the real security compliant ones, they, were, they had their own policy and they were living it. Uh, so, okay, so a bit, bit of a dated uh, result now, but I thought I'd throw it in for that reason. Um, so recognise the limitations. So one-off attempts to raise awareness are not going to work. So that previous slide illustrates part of it. The, the earlier information security breaches survey results where the on-induction only attempts were not as successful as ongoing. It's going to be more difficult to get compliance once fatigue has set in, and if that's happening for staff. It's useful to potentially identify those who've reached that sort of threshold. So proper, if you like, line management, supervision, monitoring of uh, certain things that you can collect through the system in terms of potential unauthorised access attempts and things of that nature might give some indications on who needs a tap on the shoulder. Um, might be necessary to revive the security message that's being sent through the organisation. So reducing that potential for a seen-it-all-before attitude by changing the way in which the same message is being promoted. So rather than, for example, relying on email updates or email reminders um, or indeed face-to-face -face training, having different contexts available to get the same message to people via different routes. So, some potential strategies that's just summarised here. In terms of overcoming, if we refer back to the hurdles, the things around perception, priority and responsibility, the fundamental here is going to be communication, so almost marketing to some degree, of the, the importance and of the existence of threats and what people are expected to do, and awareness raising around it, so the support for how somebody should play their part effectively. 
around the confidence, capability, and usability. So even if you've got something that is actually badly designed and interface level and tricky, if you go through a process of education and actually targeted training on how to use something effectively, that could be the route. I mean, it's going to take time and effort, but it might pay dividends in terms of getting more people to understand that difficult bit of technology that they otherwise might make mistakes with. Potentially that one as well, if you have the option to do so, could be solved by technology change. So for example, changing the product or if you actually have developed them in-house, redesigning elements of the products to support people better. So some conclusions, very quickly. Yes, it's fair to say, security is unlikely to happen by itself, so the fact is good practice isn't the natural state of affairs for many people. There are various practical barriers, even if they accept the need for protection. Many people won't be equipped to actually do it properly for themselves without some support. Technology should not, should not impede the process, it should be there supporting the protection. But some people will still inevitably have some difficulties with it. And so the awareness raising needs to be there and it needs to be properly supportive and properly addressed. Okay, so it's not just a question of, well, here's a policy, we've told you to read it, for example, or here's a session that tells you about it. It's that ongoing nurturing almost to take people along with you on the journey and to make sure that security is there and it's remembered. Okay, now a lot of the things that I've mentioned in here, are, I've taken extracts from certain things, so the, the stuff about security hurdles, the stuff about security fatigue, the levels of compliance, all of these, there's a, a more extensive treatment of those topics in this collection of podcasts. Now I mentioned also to a couple of you when we were in the security lab that we also have podcasts around that spamming video that Paul was showing, and so if you go to that address, what it will do is direct you towards iTunes U, which is the academic section of the iTunes service, and it will enable be to have a look at various podcasts that we've got based on our work at Plymouth and things that we've participated in. It's all free content, there's nothing you have to pay for, all you need is the iTunes application or app if you're doing it on an iPhone or an iPad to get access. And indeed, a lot of the talks from today will ultimately find their way into that as well. And with that, that's the end of the session from my part. Email address, Twitter thing if you want to follow me, and our Research Centre's website if you want to have a look at some of the wider stuff that we do. Thank you. Thank you.